So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Jayanta Ray, and this is a session which has been set up by Sangeet Foundation. And this session is between two uh, award-winning filmmakers, Ian Cunningham, who's made a wonderful movie called Irene's Ghost. And we also have with us uh, Sanjeev Chatterjee from University of Miami in the US. I'll not give away anything more than that because we have we are going to have a, a very uh, interesting conversation between the two of them, and we will be discussing about you know uh, mental health issues with mothers, and that is something is what we will be talking about. But before we start, um, I'll I want to give a brief in introduction to Sangeet Foundation for those who are not aware. So Sangeet Foundation believes in happiness through music and the arts. Happiness is a state of mind, dig a bit deeper. It's about mental health and wellness. Sangeet Foundation aims to create awareness about mental health in the South Asian diaspora and use music and the arts to create this awareness and also as possible alternative therapy. Please visit website sangeetfoundation.org or Sangeet Foundation Facebook page and group, Sangeet Foundation YouTube channel for more information. Interestingly, Padma Shri Aparna Sen is the patron of Sangeet Foundation. Aparna Sen is a leading Indian filmmaker. She's a humanist, writer, actor, director who made many iconic films in India. Also with us, uh, we, as part of Sangeet Foundation, we have Pilu Vidyarthi, who's a TV actress and very well connected with the uh, film industry in India through her mother, through her husband. And, you know, she, she's part of the whole thing. She's a wellness activist. Uh, and is the happiness ambassador of Sangeet Foundation. So th with that brief intro, uh, I will uh, take you to, uh, to Ian Cunningham, as well as to uh, Sanjeev Chatterjee. So I hope both of you are live now and we'll hand over the stage to Sanjeev Chatterjee. Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you, Jayanto. I hope you can hear me. I'm not sure, quite sure if you can see me. Uh, so I will try to put on my camera here. Uh, can you hear me, Jayanto? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, so my camera I don't think is on. Uh, for some reason, but uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, uh, as you said, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, I'm here in uh, sunny Miami, uh, getting more and more cloudy uh, today. Uh, I am very happy to be talking today to uh, Ian Kent Cunningham, uh, whose wonderful film I watched last week, and I encourage everyone to do the same uh, after this conversation is over if you haven't already seen it. Uh, San Sanjeev, if I may interrupt, Ian, can you can you make um, uh, the, the video on for Sanjeev Chatterjee? I think since you are the host, please. It's, yeah. There it is. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, so uh, welcome once again to everyone. So Ian, uh, let me jump right into it. Uh, I really enjoyed your film for so many reasons uh, and it will be difficult to, within an hour to really get into all of them. But I'd like to know a little bit more, I think it would benefit the audience as well about you and your background of where you grew up and how you came into the field of visual storytelling or filmmaking. Um, well, I grew up in a small town in the Midlands uh, called Nuneaton, which is um, for UK viewers near Coventry. And I um, don't really think I, I thought a huge amount about making films. It wasn't something that seemed available to you in that town, you know, from those kind of places as a kid. Um, but I went to university in Sheffield. Um, I didn't study anything to do with filmmaking. Um, and I'd always been very interested in you know, creativity and, and making things and writing and, and photography. 
And in Sheffield, I had an opportunity to work on some short films when I um, left university. And it was a time where Sheffield was kind of um, quite famous for filmmaking. There was a film called The Full Monty, which was quite famous in the UK. Um, and there was a lot of help, a lot of training for people who hadn't had any training. And that was really what gave me a start in filmmaking. Um, and uh, also the documentary festival in Sheffield is kind of world renowned and, and um, I got some work there and, and through kind of those contacts eventually started a work, working in documentary um, for television in the UK. Um, so that's kind of potted history of where I came from. And I spent a long time making observational films in, in the UK for BBC, Channel 4, ITV, all the major channels, you know, researching and um, producing and all kinds of things. Um, and this film, Irene's Ghost, is a feature documentary. So it's a cinema length documentary. And it's a film that I think I probably always wanted to make. And eventually I started to make that uh probably six or seven years ago now when i started to do that um so uh you refer to observational documentary well for our audience members well, do you want to just like give us a sense of what that means and how it's distinguished itself from different kinds of documentary filmmaking sure um so i mean documentary is a huge wide kind of field and um it's split into lots of other things. You know, there's an archive documentary kind of field where you're looking at films that have been made up of stuff that's already been shot, um, newsreel and that kind of thing. Reality television is kind of very big now. And, and the start of that was really the first observational documentaries where people were following a subject and um, filming it and not really intervening a huge amount. And that developed in UK television into um, things called documentary soaps, where you would have characters you would follow over a longer storyline or um, in a setting, you know, like a kind of shopping centre or a police station. And um, and that kind of progressed to where we are now. And, and now television is full of these kind of reality shows, which have, they kind of came out of that world a little bit, um, partly because it was a kind of cheap way of making television, I think. But... Um, yeah, observational filmmaking is, is about observing and about kind of finding a story in real life um, and then constructing it in the edit a lot of the time. It's, it's not something where you go in a lot of the time knowing what's happening. It's not sort of constructed beforehand. It's, it's something which um, you try and observe and then and sort of find the truthful things in it. Great. Uh, as you've uh, made your way uh, through so far in the world of documentary, do you uh, think of yourself as a particular kind of storyteller apart from the form? What do you like to tell stories about? Um, I've worked across fiction. I've worked with animation. I've worked with documentary. And so I think I'm quite um, open to kind of trying things that cross genres a bit and using, borrowing things from other genres. And um, in terms of the stories that I'm interested in, I'm interested in quite intimate personal stories that illuminate bigger things. Um, you know, I watched a film that you made this week also about diabetes and it's a similar thing that co concentrating on a, a family um, can illuminate a, a much bigger subject and, and grab people and interest them in that. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in telling stories that don't get told very much. So working class stories uh, interest me. And partly through making this film, I think mental health is something which um, is important to me. Irene's Ghost, the film that we are here to talk about principally, of course, is a special film for you because it has very, very deep personal uh, links. Uh, at what stage in your career, did you decide that that's a film that you wanted to make and why? Um, I think it's something I'd always wanted to do, but I'd never really known how to tackle it. It's something which was um, very personal to me. Um, so just to kind of give you 
viewers a, a, a bit of a background about it. There's my um, birth mother um, passed away when I was about three or four, um, about three, sorry. And um, it had always been a bit of a secret in my family and the sort of things that I had known about it were, it wasn't really talked about. So it was difficult to know what to do, but I, I was always interested in trying to do something to amplify my mother's life because I felt that she hadn't really um, had that uh, and been cheated in a, a little bit, I guess. Um, and it had always been something I had personal questions about. And I guess I decided to make a film when I had my own daughter. I had a daughter um, who's 11 now. And when she got to the age that I was, when I would have lost my mum, I was starting to watch her and understand a bit about the impact losing a child would have made on a child of that age, losing a mother would have made on a child of that age and, and how it would have um, impacted on me. Um, and it just strengthened um, my need to kind of find out about her. So it was less really of a where I was in my kind of career and more just a where I was in my personal life that I wanted to do it. The honesty in your film has so much to do with your willingness to depict your relationship, of course, with your daughter, with your father, with relatives that you discover along the way that you hadn't had an opportunity to meet because they were hidden from you. They all basically coalesce together to bring us a certain level of honesty, but also in the narrative, we also get involved in the dis discovery process, which is so appropriate to the issue of mental health, which is always kept, kept hidden from a view uh, due to shame, confusion, uh, lack of knowledge, lack of information, uh, whatever it is. Do you want to speak to that? Sure. Um... As I mentioned, it wasn't something that was really spoken about until I was until I was really about 18 and I was given a box of my mum's things and then um, and so it had always been this kind of subject I'd wanted to know more about, but it had been hard to talk about within the family. Um, I hadn't known my mum's family, my birth mother's family, um, so they couldn't tell me and my dad found it very, very difficult to talk about. So, and for all the reasons that you say, you know, there's the kind of confusion, there's shame, there's stigma. Um, and so, because it was a personal story, I wanted to try and make it as honestly as possible. And I think that was very important to me. And I decided to start by trying to find people who knew her. And um, so that quest kind of nature of it and the uncovering things was genuinely the kind of my journey you know I knocked on a door to see if somebody was there who was her best friend and um and she had a whole store of memories and this whole store of stories to tell me I found lots of examples of uh people who'd had because it wasn't clear to me at the beginning of this that what the issue was mental health you know that had happened to my mum um but I'd started asking questions about that because it seemed likely in some ways and people shared stories of their families with me. And, and like you say, they are kind of hidden uh, and, and hidden amongst my very close family and, and people that I'd grown up with. And, um, and I guess it gave me an opportunity to talk to my family as well and to talk to my daughter about those things that are difficult to talk about. Although this is not a conversation about the, about the, about the mechanics of filmmaking, I must ask one question. In the story, it's depicted as if you made the film alone with a DSLR camera, for those of us who know, but then the credits reveal a different story. So what was the setup uh, for people who might be you know, into filmmaking in the, in the audience and want to talk about that? Um, I mean, the credits, might be a bit misleading because um, it was pretty much made on my own in terms of the filming of it. The film itself was made by a huge number of very talented people, you know, the editor David Arthur and the animator Ellie Land and the producer Rebecca Mark Lawson and the 
people who wrote the music and all of the people that contribute to a film. But in terms of the filming, when I started making this film, I did it without any money. It was something, it was a passion project. It was something that I was passionate about. I had a camera, so I started filming and um, I would film just holding the camera and being behind it. And if I needed to film something I was doing, you know, a conversation or then I would have the camera on a tripod um, or occasionally I would have two cameras. I'd had a camera on a tripod and then the camera I was holding. Um, the only real time that we had another person filming was there's a trip that we make with my mum's best friend to Margate where I'm going on some rides and the party which is in the end credits and everything else is me basically. Um, because I wanted to keep it very intimate and personal and I think it's very um, important when you're dealing with such personal difficult stuff to try and cut out artifice you know I wanted to experience this for myself I wanted to get to know my mum that's what I wanted to do through this film and I don't I didn't want to build anything around that so uh, very often there's this tension between documentary being a journalistic journey versus documentary being an art and uh, I think uh, that in the form of the film and I'm trying very hard not to uh, give away any spoilers here uh, but uh, because I really do want people to watch it and it's available on Amazon Prime I believe uh, tell us a little bit about that thin line that you uh, that you that you uh, kind of navigate between your imagination and reality in the film? Um, I, because one of the things that I was given when I was 18 was a, a baby book. And in that book, there were writings by my mom and there were photographs. First time I'd seen photographs myself as a baby. And there were these illustrations and they were very striking to me. Um, and I, um, I'd wanted to kind of almost make the film from the point of view of that child. Um, and I had a very strong imagination of my mum when I was a kid of, of having lost her and she, I saw her in the moon or she was a thistle seed or um, if a door blew open and that was her to me. She was in everything. And I think it was just that need a child has to try and stay connected to somebody you've lost. And, you know, lots of families have experienced that. And, um, so animation is what I decided to do to kind of try and depict that and it it also is a nod to the idea that all because it's a film about memory as well memory is a story you know that we construct um, as is animation you know and it makes that more vivid that idea that you know not all memory is truthful but not all truth that you can um, depict um, tells the whole story, if you know what I mean. I really thought that uh, the animation in the film was at a very high level in that it really seamlessly marries itself to the landscape and to the transition into imagination and back uh, very, very well. And in a, in a way that's, that's entirely believable. It's, it's not something that stands apart from uh, the landscape, if I may, uh, of the story itself. And that's one of the successes of the film uh, in, uh, in what it does uh, so, so uh, well. The second part I, I wanted to say in terms of, uh, and I want to transition into this idea of depicting the discovery in a difficult kind of a setting of mental health as the issue. And you do that really masterfully, I have to say, in the way characters are developed in the film, in the storytelling. This Obviously, I'm spoiling it in some ways for people who don't want to hear this because it needs to be, uh, you know, transparent. 
uh, and uh, that, that shouldn't be the first thing on people's minds. But I really felt that apart from your discovery, which in, in itself is a story, because you're finding things, and I want to see what you're finding, and therefore I continue to watch. And you find things, and, and, and these, as they say, the onion gets peeled and peeled and peeled, and we keep going. But what's wonderful about the whole thing is that particular line of thinking gets disrupted by the development of other characters and you are left in a, in a quandary about whose story is this after all. And you realize that the journey is on the part of everyone who had shut the door on talking about this and, and putting it away as the door opens they themselves become transformed through the experience of discovery. And that, that for me is the message uh, for the audience as well, uh, to, to think about this as something where the door needs to be open. Yeah, um, and that is the beautiful gift of this for me. You know, like, I didn't know what to expect going into it, but I had such generosity from people whose doors I did literally knock on and open and people shared very personal things to them about um but that's documentary you know you start a conversation and then it it becomes something else and people don't have very many opportunities really in our daily lives to stop and have those conversations or to really consider things until someone points a camera at them and asks them sometimes you know and um or in this case you know i was asking my dad things that, that we hadn't spoken about ever and um and that because it does took place over a period of time, you know, a period of years, there is change and you do change and I changed and I understood the great difficulty that my dad and others had had dealing with this issue that my mum had experienced. And I think, um, and it worked the other way as well. Um, but yeah, you, you can't sort of make this kind of film and plan it the way that you're going to do it in terms of planning and storytelling and that kind of thing, there's storytelling things you can do in the edit, but the only planning I did was I tried to discover things um, in the right order. I didn't want to be holding back something that I knew from the audience. I wanted the discovery to come at the same time. And, and that's pretty much how, how it played out in the end. So uh, let's jump into the, the, the crux of this conversation. What did you discover? about uh, mental health in specific in general and specific through this process that the audience should know about um so it gradually came out through friends testimonies through family one of my aunties started talking to me um and then my dad and some medical records i managed to find that my mum had, had had something called postpartum psychosis um i'll say it again because it's quite hard to understand postpartum psychosis and that is a kind of mental illness that comes on very quickly after birth um, in the sort of days and first couple of weeks after birth. And it can affect um, one in 500 people. Um, and the mother experiences, um, can experience hallucinations, um, psychosis, mania, not wanting to sleep, wanting to talk all the time you know, very extreme emotions about the baby um, and also deep depression. Um, and for my mother, it was the start of a, a bipolar illness. Um, you know, I learned many things about mental illness throughout this project, but one of the shocking things for me was, you know, birth is the time of most vulnerability for human beings for mental illness of any kind. Um, and it's a trigger, it's the biggest trigger for bipolar illness. Um, and so she, she was ill with that for a couple of years before eventually, um, she passed away. And, um, so I learned a lot through, um, making the film about the mental health struggles that mums can have. Obviously there's postnatal depression as well, which is a very widespread thing and about the way that people struggle to talk about them, um, even within families, um, and, and my, my own self, you know, I, I experienced kind of anxiety around my health in my 20s, partly, I think, because of this experience and 
when I was a child, but never really got help or talked about it. And so I guess I understood more about that through making the film as well. Um, and I, I do feel that that community coming together and talking was very cathartic for everybody um, in the end. It's very hard to start that conversation, but I think um, people benefited from it. Um, you know, people often talk about film as a medium to change the world, but my, in my experience, the first person to be changed through making films like this is the filmmaker himself. So, in a, you know, the, it's been a couple of years that, uh, that you've been uh, done with this film and it's out in the world and people have watched it. But tell us about your journey of within this line of work of uh, postpartum psychosis, uh, mental health. And I, I think you have a guest you want to bring in. Uh, so to talk about that as we uh, bring in our next guest. So um, because the film does touch on maternal mental health and um, I worked a lot with a charity called Action on Postpartum Psychosis, who are a really um, helpful organization. And if anybody has any relatives who they think have experienced this or are going through something similar, they have a, a forum and they have peer support groups and they can do things online through Zoom and things like that to help people as well as other kinds of um, therapies um, and help and support. And um, through them and others, um, uh, maternal mental health uh, week and um, the Roshni group um, I've met lots of um, mothers and I've met lots of people involved in um, mental health campaigning maternal mental health campaigning and that's what we've tried to do with screenings is explain to people a little more about the issues and and how to get help and um, yeah I'd just like to introduce um, Panisha who I met through the Roshni group um, I'm going to press some buttons and see if it works and um hi Ian hi and um Panisha I met this week and I'm sure after this um whole situation gets a little bit easier to manage you know going out and doing these kind of screenings and things we'll probably work on something because um Panisha had a very similar experience to me and has, has had, had her own experience with with mental health I don't know Panisha if you want to just introduce yourself and um, explain a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I mean, I'll, I'll start off by trying to relate it to um, Irene's ghost where I um, stumbled upon this through social media, through Roshni too. And um, the ex after I'd watched Irene's ghost, I had a, a push to, to kind of connect with Ian because our, the baseline of our story was so similar. Um, and at first I thought it was a a community thing that you didn't talk about mental health but postnatal mental health is shunned even more um in the sense that you just almost don't speak about that person um or or you know when you mentioned in the film that um your mum was in a coma i i often would get told uh, growing up that my mum had just left and there was nothing further to that and again it, similar to you in a timeline at the age of 18 I started to explore and into my 20s you know this quite doesn't quite add up now you know I, I used to meet my mum um on a on regular occasions maybe in the holidays I lived with my dad and my gran um, and then later on the age of four my stepmom came in um, but there were so many elements of the film and even the way it was represented in animation you know it, it was so moving because my journey my journey's gone through a whole process now where I actually work and have worked in mental health um I want to do a lot more for this cause um in particular something that we've discussed before is is helping the the men that may be in this situation that have closed up and maybe like your dad or my dad that have closed up for not a few months about it, absolute years, decades. Um, and that can take its toll on them if there isn't anything out there to get that support. Because let's be honest, having a child is this joyous time in people's lives. And you're talking about the family and the mom and the dad or whoever it may be, to then juxtaposition that with a silence about the mother um, 
is so detrimental in some ways that we need to open this up. Um, I know Ian, we've touched on this in our own chat, um, the fact that in 30 odd years, probably longer, there, there has been movement in the field, but, but not much. And the way you depicted it and the emotion in the film was the first time a medium has connected to me about that story and the element of that upbringing, not understanding quite what had happened. Even though I used to see my mum every now and again, um, I didn't quite understand what had happened and it, it's taken me a, a long time to even start to understand so I just want to say thank you uh, firstly for the film thank you I think you know that's um, it comes from a place of you know love doesn't it that idea of protecting people and not talking about it I think a lot of the time yeah. and that as well as the other things that play into it um, people think that children can't deal with those kind of difficult subjects but I think the younger people learn about mental health you know the better and because that equips them with tools to be able to deal with it um, and the, the the experiences that they might have and you know um, we've spoken as well about there's a hereditary nature to this um, yeah where you're more likely to to experience it if your mother um, had uh, experienced bipolar disorder or experienced postpartum psychosis so there's a need to talk about it so that families understand what their risks might be um but it's more just generally i think it's 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 um and it's not for everybody not everybody is able to talk about those things but mm. but small steps you know can be important but we've got the means to provide that support um now more than ever because once upon a time you know you would ring up you can always be anonymous now we've got you know online chats groups um text numbers there's there's a there's so many platforms of support that could be utilized to be available um for this this subject and mental health in various avenues alone um i i mean i don't i don't know if you mind me saying but my own story is I recently became a mum um, a couple of years ago, but the hereditary nature of that was that, and I, I didn't know this until afterwards, when I was pregnant, um, my relationship with my dad, I feel, um, shifted quite a lot. There was a lot of fear in him, and it was only after um, I'd had my son that because there was this 80% chance of me going down the same path, um, getting postpartum psychosis, it transitioning to bipolar depression um my dad had actually said to my stepmom in a conversation if there is a very high chance that you will have to leave your job and look after the child that Tanisha has um because it had almost brought back I feel I mean I don't know if we'd be ready for that discussion now maybe after this if, he watch, if he's watching it um just to it just brought back what had happened maybe 33 years ago um, and the fact that I had I have um, and I manage a, a, a mental health condition um, but it was only because my search like yours made me want to explore mental health so after coming out of uni being in marketing I felt this calling to go into mental health knew that I was struggling in some arenas got some psychiatric help um, and then thought okay, I want to make this my mission to help me manage my condition, but also to help others. And especially in, you know, uh, the British Asian community, I just felt there was, there was such a big gap in the education and understanding. Um, so in a way, that experience, your experiences led you to um, going into this field and wanting to focus on that. And, and the same, same with me and, you know, you, you search for that and you're trying to revolutionize that that pain or that confusion that you've gone through. Yeah. This is a question for Panisha. Uh, Panisha, uh, are there specific things that the audience should know, specific steps they might take uh, in this direction uh, through your studies, through, through your thinking through these things uh, that you can share with us? Uh, in regards to mental health? Yes. So I would say, um, and me and Ian touched upon this, it's just some element of 
warning signs. So we all have physical health and we all have mental health. So, you know, whether you have a diagnosis or not, you'll have triggers that anger you, you will have triggers that make you upset. You will have certain situations that you shy away from or, or cannot fathom going into. Um, but just to utilize and, and keep the conversation going. So, you know, um, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying so. We had a chat about um, Irene potentially um, before this happened. She, she used to visit the doctors quite a lot, didn't she? Um, yeah. Now, if maybe a doctor had picked up on that and gone, hmm, is she coping with things well? And I know that years ago, maybe it wasn't picked up, but now I'm where we focus on mental health a bit more, the people around you or your support network talk out for each other create kind of an emotional um, support pack, see what your triggers are. If someone is pregnant and they've already got a bit of anxiety, uh, depression or whatever it might be, to pick up on that um, and to, to use it as maybe a sign. I, I was lucky like when I was pregnant because I disclosed that I um, suffer from a mental health condition. I was monitored the whole way through and when I was feeling a bit off maybe the emotions were everywhere hormones were everywhere in my last trimester I made it clear um, and it was because I knew I had to speak to get the support whether that was medication therapy talking a support group um, and I mentioned this to Ian as well one of the big things I advocate for since I started um, working in mental health um, and support is peer support in every arena so if you you know if you were struggling if, if you know you became a new mom or you started university you usually start going to a group where people share similar experiences that can sometimes be even an addi additional value to seeing a counsellor or a psychiatrist or a psychologist or taking medication because you'll actually feel like wow somebody else has kind of been there they know that emotion or that feeling that I'm going through um, hence the reason when I, when I watched Irene's Ghost I, I just I just felt a lot lighter even though I, I feel like I've processed that now and I have a good relationship and understanding of my mum's condition and I try and support her through that now um, seeing Irene's Ghost and the way it was depicted was peer support for me it was peer support in an art form that was beautiful because it evo evoked the emotion but it may didn't make me feel alone if that makes sense uh ian uh this may be a good point for you to share a clip from the film so people can get a feel for the film if you will please sure i'll try and uh, i'll share the trailer i just want to say just before i do that as well thanks so much to Venetia. and um and also that people do get better you know the treatment for this is much better now yeah live very normal lives after they've experienced it it's not something to be you know scared of in that sense because being going to, approaching you know medical professionals about it can help you during pregnancy get mitigation for it and it can be managed now um we have great mother and baby units so um and treatments um i'm gonna see what happens here i'll try and play the trailer I don't know if you choose the memories that stay with you or if they choose you. My first childhood memory is of being in long grass. I'm outside a hospital and I don't know why. Who do you think that is? The next door neighbour? That is my mummy. Your mummy's grandma. It was an unwritten rule that we don't talk about Irene. When you don't have the real story, you have to build it for yourself. My dad waited until I was 18 to officially tell me about Irene. I always knew though. Tell me about her. It was a long time ago. 
we go. Then it was taken away. Hello there. Hello. Come on. Come Thank on. You. I couldn't believe that you thought nobody remembered her. That I've never forgot, Irene. We're very close friends. And I'm pleased that it's brought you in. Sometimes you never really get to know the true story of your life, do you? So, you know, one thing, uh, actually, there's a question uh, I, that I wanted to go, uh, get into as well, is that what are the specific reasons in your experience that people don't want to talk about this? What makes it something that has a taboo associated with it? It's some, sometimes, for me at least, it's hard to understand. Um, I think just specific to this film, for my father, it was too painful. Um, it was something that he found very, very hard to talk about, to think about, and that was his way of getting through it. And I, I understand that, I think. The thing is, I wonder how much impact that has over a period of time when you do suppress that. Um, but sometimes that's the only way to get through a situation. So I, I totally understand that. Um, I think it, there is a sort of sense of shame. I think people don't like the idea that um, because mental illness is one of those things where people somehow associate it with um, that it's your fault somehow, that you brought it on yourself or that you're responsible for it and that it's not like other illnesses and that's not true in any way. You know, it's just, um, it's just the same as anything else like that. Um, but, but it still has that association I don't know, Panisha, what you think? Yeah, um, I agree with you there. I think it's the stigma around it. Um, and I, I know the arena's changed a bit now, um, but if you think about it, 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 it's the male arena of mental health, isn't it? It would be if, if you had a, a, a wife or a partner in, in those days that um, it was currently suffering from it, the chances of speaking out were very low. And that's still not really progressed or opened up um right now and it, and it's what i touched upon before it's the juxtaposition of an the most joyous moment you can you can imagine in a person's life and uh, bringing a new life into the world to a mom then struggling um and suffering with something that unbeknown to them alters their their chemicals, their brain, they, they've been through a treacherous experience for nine months where their body's changed. And then psychologically, that the, the, the chemicals in the mind have changed. And, and what, what I liked about um, an element in the film was your mom's friend remembering Irene and her personality and her vivaciousness before all this. And I think that's a good part um, to remember across the board with mental health is that we all can struggle um, and there will be a part when we're struggling with our mental health where we don't look like or sound like the people that we are today but it's it's educating people on understanding um, and, and working through that and finding avenues to help people work through that. So Farah is asking you know what's the role of the NHS and health uh, professionals uh, around the world in uh, enabling these conversations and making the situation better. Uh, are there any recommendations both of you might have? Hanisha, well, you've been working with the Roshni project. Is that something that... So we, we, we recently met and I'm hoping to, to work with them um, in the future. I mean, my personal experience is that when I was pregnant because I'd already disclosed um, that I suffered from a mental health uh, condition that I was monitored throughout. Um, what I think the NHS 
can do even further is provide um, support groups, support platforms fr from the day for families and, um, you know, expectant mothers in case this situ situation arises the same way, you know, during a pregnancy, you go to classes about um, feeding or this, that and the other. There are so many classes out there that you attend with your partner. You can attend birthing classes and things like that. Maybe make it mandatory to, to go to some of these where you learn about signs, triggers, warnings, where men can access support, where families can access support, how to support um, someone, how to protect your own mental health if somebody in your family then ends up having postpartum depression or uh, postpartum psychosis. To embed that into it and almost make it mandatory to attend these so you can at least educate yourself with a little bit of a toolkit in case that scenario arises. Uh, but even so, if you didn't use it, but you saw the signs and you went to that class and you saw another expectant mother or husband that seemed to be struggling, it's about sharing and imparting that wisdom to, to just have a bit of a toolkit there and a bit of awareness. Don't know what your thoughts on that. Was, in the UK, um, there's been um, some much needed investment in the past couple of years in community mental health teams for maternal mental health. Um, so it is an improving situation and there are, um, and that is through the NHS, you know, there are NHS yeah. community teams um, who can provide support. And if you can find them through your GP or you can find them um, online often um, directly um, and you can go down that pathway and, and find, and they're geared up to support mums and expectant mums and families yeah. uh, in these situations. Um, and, and if it's required, there's not enough of them, but there are mother and baby units where mums and babies can get kept, can be kept together when, uh, cause that's a, a big fear. I think that mums have when this experience happens that they'll be separated from their baby, but, um, the best thing for mum and baby is for them to be together. So, um, and there's, you know, really good NHS care in, in lots of areas of the country for that. I don't know, uh, you know, uh, what, uh, where the idea came to you from in terms of the hereditary nature of mental health issues. But I know growing up in India, as I think uh, there are people in the audience who grew up in India, uh, this was a conversation that would be had actually at the time when wedding arrangements were being done, that families would actually surreptitiously look into family histories about mental health. So what, where did you find this information? At that time, we thought, you know, at least I thought, well, this is all, you know, hocus pocus. But now we know that that may be a strong signifier. So I want you to talk to that a little bit more about, you know, how we found out and what the science says about the hereditary nature of mental health issues. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's a developing field and um, I think broadly mental health isn't, um, mental ill health isn't directly like hereditable in, in the way that some illnesses are. There isn't like a gene that causes a particular thing. There's been research into certain types of mental ill health like um, schizophrenia, which shows a, a group of genes that are common to it. Um, but it, it does often seem to be experienced in families where there are client mm -hmm. clusters of experiences. And certainly with postpartum psychosis in particular, there is an increased risk if your mother had postpartum psychosis or bipolar disorder. Um, you can look that up. I don't want to say the wrong numbers. Yeah. Um, Panisha might know um, what they are. Um, so through my experience, it was just looking into my mum's family. I found so many experiences, so many people in that family tree had been institutionalized or had had similar experiences. And I think you do find that there are common things for maternal mental illness. You'll find that in common. But you're you're there's so many things that play into it. It's your environment and um, you know your upbringing and kind of. Um, 
your lots of things about your situation that impact on your mental health um it's not just the kind of you know the genes you inherit uh, and they can change you know there's something called epigenetics about i mean this is not the forum for this conversation but where genes have switches and that can be switched on and off by poor or better um environmental factors or ex life experiences Anisha, what do you think um <laughs> Again, like Ian said, I, I, I probably I don't know the uh, the right avenues to go down. Probably better to research it on on um, on that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, neither of us are experts in terms of we're not doctors, so. Um... All, all I probably could say, um, I, I work in sporting children at the moment, um, and and that's the path. That I want to go down eventually in children's mental health um, officially but it is about teaching children from a young age and I'm talking primary school age um, so I think in the US is that kindergarten or above um, just emotional awareness and looking out for any signs um, of where you know you think there might be a struggle and and, and and finding different approaches for that um, individual from a young age, I think, and giving them the right tools. Because as much as it is taught a bit more in schools now um, in the UK, um, I think going forward um, after the pandemic, there'll probably be a big push on another initiative to help um, struggling uh, children with working through the issues that come out of this and I think that's really important to educate them not just on you know mandatory subjects but that their own emotional skills. Well before I hand this over to our host Gianto I'd like to thank both Ian for a wonderful film and I hope that uh, members of the audience will take the time to go to Amazon and uh, watch the film. Uh, it certainly helps uh, open the conversation up. Uh, my takeaway from uh, uh, this conversation and from the film is what's important is that we talk amongst ourselves, talk uh, with our loved ones. Uh, and if we see something, do something. And Panisha, thank you for your courage and your, your willingness to come join us. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it certainly has been enlightening for me. Uh, Jain Toh, over, over to you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Thank you. Thanks a lot for that lovely session. I think uh, Panisha being our special guest today, uh, quite a surprise one as well. Thank you so much for joining us and, and giving your perspective. I think it's very important to understand from a person who's undergoing those kind of issues. Um, so it's very important for that. So that is one. And then of course, uh, Ian, you know, uh, thank you for being, uh, for taking us through a journey of Irene's ghost and uh, what a wonderful movie. So I think all of us should go back and watch it once more if you haven't watched it and with the perspective which Ian has given us. So uh, that, that would really, you know, uh, provide us with a uh, perspective of, uh, of this uh, wonderful movie. So, uh, and, and the issue as well of, of mental health for mothers. Uh, our happiness for mothers uh, so as we speak and finally sanjeev uh, who's come who's logged in all the way from miami to conduct this session thank you sanjeev so much he's a he's a filmmaker uh, he's a award winning filmmaker as well and uh, he has been you know um, uh, so and he has obliged us by being there with us it was a very tiring long flight <laughs> right. right so yeah so th thank you for for being there i'm sure we will have an another session another day about sanjeev's movies uh and he has some very interesting movies uh especially for the indian diaspora and i'll go back 25 or 30 years which is where he they made a movie called purechutney.com uh, and this pure chutney was about the Indian diaspora in Trinidad. Is that right, Sanjeev? That is correct. And there's another one about the Indian diaspora in South Africa called Dirty Laundry. 
Oh, fabulous. So probably another day, that's for another day. And uh, I'm sure uh, if you, you would have gained uh, for the audience, thank you for being there, for the lovely audience, for, for patiently going through this. You know, it, it is not a very easy topic to, to talk about. Um, yes, it is very important. I think, you know, if we are able to make people aware of it, I think we can help people, we can save lives, we can save time, and we can make child, childbirth a very happy experience, which is, which is what it is supposed to be, uh, rather than a stressful one. So I think, you know, um, I hope you would have gained something out of it. And if you do have questions, do feel free to, to write to sangeet.foundation at gmail.com. I'm sure if there are help, uh, there, if there is any answers, we, we can get those answers. Uh, especially from the Roshi project, uh, which is run by by the NHS, and and I'm sure we can get some help as well. So do reach out for help, and especially during these COVID-19 times, it it's a double whammy really for you know going through childbirth during COVID-19 times. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, with that, we'll close the session. Stay well, stay safe, stay happy, and we'll catch up. And do do look out for some very, very useful and wonderful sessions coming up in Sangeet Foundation in the coming weeks. With that, thank you all, and we'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. So I think, Ian, you would have to close the session okay. with the host today. I just closed the Zoom meeting, yeah? Yeah, and you need to say leave meeting, leave, close the meeting. Okay, so I think with that, we can end. We're ending the meeting. Thank you so much for that.